You probably already noticed that every time you go to the supermarket and check your food's labels, they don't usually come from somewhere nearby. In fact, sometimes they come from very far away. Bananas from Central America, berries from South America, fish from China, even meat from very distant New Zealand. But how bad is it for the environment? Should we just eat local? Hold on, things are not that simple. Let's look into it. The United States has never imported so much food. The numbers are staggering. From 1999 to 2017, the total passed from $43 billion to $137 billion. The amount of imported fruits in the markets has increased more than three times in the same period. And the number of vegetables also saw growth of more than threefold. The US imported most of the food from Mexico, followed by Canada, France, Italy, and China. All of this food traveling around the world poses some questions. Does it make sense to buy food that came from so far away? In an era of global warming and climate change, why do we need to eat a piece of meat from an animal raised on the other side of the world? These concerns became a theory and the term food miles was coined in the 1990s by Tim Lane, a City University of London professor. The term is used to present the distance that the food is transported from the place it's produced until it reaches the consumer and can also be used to measure the carbon footprint of a product. Basically speaking, the longer the product travels, more energy is needed and therefore the worse it is for the environment. A big movement of buy local, eat local was created in response to this. Environment activists started to believe that food from distant countries was probably worth avoiding. And the locally produced fruits, meat and vegetables from the nearby farmer's market was probably a better choice. But things are not as simple as they seem. Food miles alone does not show exactly how bad a carbon footprint of a product is. It is certainly one of the indicators, but taking it alone can lead to a false sense of green responsibility. A better way of calculating the environmental impact of a product is called life cycle assessment and takes into consideration more than just how far away it was transported. It considers the production process, the way it is stored, the international distribution, the way it is processed, packaged, how it is locally distributed, how it's kept in the supermarket, and how it is dealt with by the consumer. As we can see here in this graph, food miles are just a fraction of the actual impact of the product on the environment. The life cycle assessment method takes into account details like the kind of fertilizers it is used for production, what kind of packaging, and the way the product is disposed of and recycling possibilities. But although more complex than just looking into food miles, the method is also not perfect and might still leave out some important aspects of food production of the calculation, like the social impact. In summary, it's very complicated to precisely say what the carbon footprint of our food is. So much so that even companies that tried to calculate and label all products have had a hard time doing so. A famous case is from British supermarket chain Tesco, one of the biggest in the world. In 2007, they announced the plan of labeling the carbon footprint of all the 70,000 products they had in stores. Five years later, they called off the plan, blaming the amount of work in the process, the difficulties involved, and other supermarket chains that were not doing the same. Figuring out carbon footprint is hard because we must look into the details. If we look at food miles, for example, there are many nuances. The way the food is transported is very important. Cargo ships are the most efficient, followed by trains, then trucks, and lastly planes. A container transported on a ship emits 0.14 kilograms of CO2 per ton kilometer, while this number is 6.8 by plane. But if we look at how food is transported around the world nowadays, only 0.16% are transported by planes and 58.97% are transported by ships. Scientists of Lincoln University discovered that a piece of lamb meat produced and sold in the UK can have a higher carbon footprint than if produced in New Zealand and transported to the UK by ship. They analyzed in both countries the water use, harvesting techniques, fertilizer outlays, renewable energy applications, means of transportation, and the kind of fuel used, the amount of carbon dioxide absorbed during photosynthesis, disposal of packaging, storage procedures and dozens of other cultivation inputs. Through their calculations, a lamb raised on New Zealand clover-choked pasture and shipped 11,000 miles by ship to Britain produced 1,520 pounds of carbon dioxide emissions per ton. At the same time, if this same lamb was produced in Britain using the feed, it would produce 6,280 pounds of carbon dioxide per ton. 
In summary, buying British lamb from the local market would be more damaging to the environment than buying from New Zealand. However, there are also examples of studies that point in the other direction. That's the case with German apples. In general, countries that produce apples can sell fresh ones year-round without importing. This is thanks to a technology called controlled atmosphere. The apples are usually harvested in the autumn, with the second semester in the northern hemisphere, and are stored in rooms with controlled temperature, oxygen, carbon dioxide, and humidity levels. This way, the stored apples do not fully develop but, let's say, they go to sleep. This allows apples to stay fresh for longer after harvest than if they were simply refrigerated. That's how you can buy local apples the whole year. But does this increase the apple's carbon footprint? Is it still better to buy local? Two German scientists tried to answer this question. They compared German stored apples energy use to fresh apples imported from New Zealand. Different from the lamb meat from the UK, the German apples had a better result. Taking into consideration all the emissions from cultivation to consumer shopping, the local apple stored in a controlled atmosphere required 5.893 megajoules per kilo, while the imported apples from New Zealand required 7,499 megajoules per kilo. But again, it's not that simple. The two scientists calculated the impact of keeping the apples for five months. In the apple industry, it's not rare for the fruit to stay in these stored rooms for more than that. If it stays nine months, for example, importing from New Zealand might be a better solution. And it also depends on what kind of energy is used in the process. In summary, food miles can be indicators of an environmental impact, but alone are not usually enough to point out the actual damage. The best way is to look at the whole food supply chain. But there are ways of making informed decisions when it comes to what food and from where you should buy. Let's look into some important actions you can start taking to minimize the carbon footprint of your food. If you are going to worry about food miles, make sure that you avoid what is transported by air. This includes perishable products such as asparagus, green beans, strawberries, and other berries. Just as an example, let's take a look at the difference in CO2 emissions between green beans that are found in Dutch supermarkets. The ones coming from Kenya by plane emit much more CO2 than the ones grown locally or from Morocco, which arrived in the country by sea. So, regardless of what you buy, just make sure it arrived at your city by land or sea, never by air. The best way to avoid berries traveling around the world by plane is not eating them all year round. Purchasing in-season produce can help you reduce the carbon footprint of your food. This way it's very much likely that you are not only going to avoid the products coming from far away, but you will also avoid the local ones that are cultivated in heated greenhouses or stored in cold storage. The amount of energy used in in-season products is usually lower and can result in products with a lower carbon footprint. Don't forget, the way you consume also impacts the carbon footprint of your food. If you are buying a couple of oranges and placing them in a plastic bag, the carbon footprint is already much higher than if you took them home in your tote bag. Make sure you avoid packaging when not necessary and remember, any petrochemical-derived packaging along the way just increases the carbon footprint of your food. It is always important to check where your food comes from. As we saw in this video, distance alone is not the only information that matters when it comes to carbon footprint, but it can be very important. And if the package does not have the information about how the product got to you, knowing where it comes from can help you understand the journey that the food took to get to your table. There is plenty of information available online, and it is usually possible to find out how the journey might have impacted the environment. Do your research. You don't need to be a radical vegan to make a difference, but reducing the consumption of foods with a high carbon footprint can already be helpful. The total emissions from global livestock are 7.1 gigatons of CO2 per year, this is 14.5% of all greenhouse gas emissions by human activities. Cattle are the animal species responsible for about 65% of the livestock sector's emissions. Reducing the amount of beef consumption would already be a step in the right direction if your idea is to reduce the carbon footprint of your diet. In the end, knowing what you eat and where it comes from can make a huge difference. Be aware, pay attention, research and make sure that what you eat is in line with the world you want to live in. So that's it for this video, how important are food miles? We hope you like to know more about the food journey from production to your plate. Since you made it to the end, click around and keep watching.
And don't forget to like our video and subscribe to our channel.